In 1972, Clint Eastwood presented Al Ruddy with his Oscar for producing The Godfather. Ruddy also produced such films as The Longest Yard, Little Foss and Big Halsey with Robert Redford, and The Cannonball Pictures, one, two, and three. But we're gonna to talk to him today about the birth pangs of The Godfather, its gestation period in development, its painful production process, and of course, the controversies about the editing. Al, everyone assumes that a picture that is revered as much as The Godfather, that it was smooth sailing all the way through. People think that greatness is built into a movie. But I think you and I recall it a little differently. There was not one phase of The Godfather that wasn't difficult and stressful. Do you agree? Peter, when I started The Godfather, I was young and beautiful. Look at me. <laughs> this is the ravages of doing that movie. <laughs> There wasn't one day, seriously, between casting, the budget, the body politic with the league, and uh, the city of New York. Right. Forget all the way through the post-production. But you know, there's an old, um, there's a cliche in Hollywood, and cliches are often repeated truths, right? Movies that are, are torturous on the set make great movies. I agree. When you're happy on the set, you tend to be a little lazy and slovenly. That's that right. movie had everybody on edge every minute. Let's just start at the, at the beginning. So we had the manuscript, which was not complete, of course. It was just, you know, some of it was a novel and then it was an outline written by Mario Puzo, of course. Paramount optioned the manuscript and paid Mario a sum of money so that he could feed his family while he completed his novel. But you got to know Mario very well. He really was a formidable guy, wasn't he? Well, what, what, what I, you suggested I go to New York and meet him. So I went to New York and I, I met him at the uh, St. Regis Hotel. He, he was, had an overcoat, he weighed about 280 pounds. The little king, he had the book under his arm, came walking in. Uh, I said, Mario, there's a a prejudice in Hollywood towards hiring the novelist to do the screenplay because you can't let go of anything. Right. He throws the book on the floor. I never want to see that again. I want to go to Hollywood and do the book with you, do the screenplay. His wife told me, look, if Mario goes with you, you have to promise you'll watch me because he has diabetes and he's overweight. On that condition, if you do that, I'll let him go with you. I said, okay. Now I'm watching him every day. My pants are starting, I'm on a diet, I'm losing my clothes, and he's getting heavier. <laughs> I find out Frankie Arno from Jacopo's is bringing a pizza up every night, having pizza with Mario Puzo. A month ago, he bought the movie rights to this book, a bestseller. And the main character is a guy just like me. I, uh, you know, I wouldn't even have to act, just be myself. But, uh, oh, Godfather, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. <laughs> You can act like a man! What's the matter with you? Is this how you turn down a Hollywood Pinocchio that uh, cries like a woman? <laughs> what can I do? What can I do? We ran, as you know, early on with Frank Sinatra, uh, with a Johnny Fontaine character, that uh, Johnny, uh, Frank Sinatra got a, tried to get a TRO against us with Louis Neiser mm -hmm. uh, to stop the movie. That was overturned because the book had come out. Uh, but one night I, w I went into Chasen's with, with Mario to have some spaghetti. <laughs> and as we walked in, there's John Wayne, Frank Sinatra, and Jilly sitting in the booth. And Mario said, I'd love to go get his autograph. I said, are you losing it? The man is suing us. <laughs> so I take my pull him side booth, and I finally sit him down. I get up for a minute. A guy walks up to Mario. He says, Mario, you want to meet Frank Sinatra? <laughs> the next thing is a screamer. Yeah. My, uh, Frank Sinatra's calling him a, a stoolie for the FBI. I'm going to kill your wife and kids. Mario being Sicilian, trying to grab the knife and jump over. When I drove him back to the hotel, he was crying. He said, you don't understand. In an Italian home, my mother had two pictures on the wall, the Pope and Frank Sinatra. Before it became an international bestseller, you and I and Francis we're having perfectly genial conversations about it. Then it becomes an international bestseller, and that's when the Gulf and Western people, all of a sudden, this was a star book, and it was given to every hot director in the world, and they all turned it down. That's exactly right. They all called you and said what? They had one main problem with the book. It glamorized the mafia, remember? Well, the, two things. 
It glamorized the mafia. But Peter, the truth, in fact, is it also got turned down because some of the, like Fred said, it wasn't an important book in their mind, a major liter. Yeah. It was a pulpy, fascinating, riveting story, but wasn't Pulitzer Prize winner. Yeah. And so they overlooked it. Yeah. You know? And so, at your behest, I must say, I went up to meet Francis, and we had our meetings, and then he had to come down and prove <laughs> that he could do it as a low budget movie. Yeah. When I start when I started on the project, I was told by Stanley Jaffe that I have to come to New York and Charlie Bludorn, who owned Gulf and Western, had to approve the producer and the director. Right. I fly to New York and I've worked on the weekend on the book trying to figure out one hundred and fifty pages we could keep. So I go to Stanley's office with my suitcase, gonna have lunch. This door flies open, and this mad Austrian comes out. Hello, I'm Charlie Bluedorn. I said, hello, I'm Al Ruddy. The next line out of his mouth isn't, how was the flight? Ruddy, what do you want to do with this movie? I swear to God, you understand this. I looked at this neurotic. I said, if I ever touch that book, I'm out of this room. I looked at him, I said, Charlie, I want to make an ice blue, terrifying movie about people you love. That's brilliant. <laughs> that scene runs out. <laughs> what I said, Stanley, what the hell is that? <laughs> I'll be right back. He says, Charlie, I love you. You got the job. Buonasera. Buonasera. What have I ever done to make you treat me so disrespectfully? If you had come to me in friendship, then the scum that ruined your daughter would be suffering this very day. And if by chance an honest man like yourself should make enemies, then he would become my enemies. And then they would fear you. Francis, from the start, was enamored of the idea of Brando, right? Yeah, absolutely. And explain why the studio resisted Brando. The studio had in their mind that this was going to be a low-budget movie. Now, what happened on the movie, as you well remember, there were conflicting story. Everyone had another story about who should play this, who should play that, where should we shoot it, because everyone was in the mix. It got to the point to say, well, who are we making this movie for? Uh, Stan said, well, you guys are trying to make an art movie with Marlon Brando. He's not going to... Remember what they said? Under no way is he going to do that part? That's right. Brando knew that the studio, didn't want the it. corporate part of the studio, didn't want it. He knew that, and he was a very proud man. And he always said, I'll never audition of for a role, because that's not something that Marlon Brando ever did. But he did end up auditioning for this role. And how did that come about? Well, first of all, as you may recall, Francis was going to want uh, uh, Lars Olivier. He wanted Lars Olivier. For, Mario wanted Marlon Brando. We sent it to Marlon's house, right? Marlon said, um, I don't know, I don't want to play a gangster, blah, 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 blah. But then, as it got a little hotter, he said, okay, I have an idea. I have an idea of creating the character. So Francis agreed to go to his house with his video camera. Marlon put Kleenex in his mouth, put some shoe polish in his hair, streaked it, put a pillow in his jacket, a cardigan. <laughs> and had a little cup of Denobly, uh, Denobly and a little cup of uh, espresso. I didn't say a word. You saw the test. He's going, uh, uh. <laughs> Then we ran in New York. Remember what happened? Riveted to the screen. They couldn't move. Yeah. That's how we got the part. Yeah. I want all inquiries made. I want no acts of vengeance. I want you to arrange a meeting with the heads of the five families. This war stops now. At a certain point, at least within our group, we definitely had all coalesced, and we our list is a find the list that ended up in the movie. Right. We all wanted Al. Uh, Jimmy finally 
acquiesced that he would be playing Michael, he was going to play Sonny. Carmine Caridi got put. But the actors in the movie, basically, we got that list in our hands, and that's who we wanted. Mm -hmm. And that's when the fight started. Now, explain briefly why there was a prejudice against Al Pacino. Because once again, Francis, you liked Al, uh, and Evans really did like Al, but there was there was questions because a, he did look very clean cut at that point, and he was very short. There was never any doubt that he was a great actor. Right. He did Tiger on Broadway, got Tony Awards, he got it. But he's not that. By this time, 60 million people had read that book. And Michael was a hero. Yeah. A Marine, Al Pacino, <laughs> five foot six. When he tried to get in the building the first time, they wouldn't let him in. It's a, it's a guy down there saying he's Al Pacino. I said, here's Al Pacino, <laughs> you have with. That's it, let him in. You know. But you know, yeah. he's short. Didn't have a name, yeah. And it's a world famous book at this time. Mm -hmm. Everyone is reading. You know, you know how many. Everyone had their own. Every idiot talk show host had his ideas. Who should play Al Pacino? Right. Who was, should play it this? It was obsessive. The discussion about it, it almost got out of hand. You're gonna search me when I first meet them, right? So I can't have a weapon on me then. But if Clemenza can figure a way to have a weapon planted there for. Me, And I'll kill them both. <laughs> you were talking to, at the behest of the boys, with the mafia guys. And explain how those contacts developed. Bob Evans had gotten a call from Joe Colombo, the Italian American Anti Defamation League, which was a front organization for, for, for um, the mob. I go to the meeting and I said, Joe, look, I know your anxiety. This movie will not defame Italian Americans. It's got a Jewish producer who's corrupt, an Irish cop. It's equal opportunity. Everyone's corrupt, okay? <laughs> but I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. Because remember, no one had seen the script. If you come to my office tomorrow, I'm going to let you read the script. He said, You will? I said, Yeah. All they wanted, as you might recall, to take the word mafia out of the screenplay. Right. If they would have read it, mob guys don't have to say we're mafia guys. It was used one time right. in the entire script. And that's when Bobby Duval goes to the West Coast <laughs> and the guy says, you try to get the job. He says, you can tell your boss, no Guinea, uh, Goomba, Wob, Greasewall mafias are coming out of the woodwork to get Johnny Fontaine that job. Yeah. So we cross mafia. Are you trying to muscle me? Absolutely now not. Now listen to me, you smooth talking son of a bitch. Let me lay it on the line for you and your boss, whoever he is. Johnny Fontaine will never get that movie. I don't care how many Dago, Guinea, Wop, Greaseball, Goombas come out of the woodwork. I'm German-Irish. But why did you end up almost getting fired? Because, because what happened, I was naive. I didn't realize still how big The Godfather had become. Yeah. I now want to get the word out to the Italian community. We were having trouble to, to do the movie properly. So Joe says, we want to have a little press conference. You want to come by in the office? I said, yeah, why not? <laughs> I go to this, I get in the elevator with 40 guys with sun guys. Where's everyone going? I go to this meeting and NBC, ABC, everyone is there that I made a deal with the Italian American League to take the word mafia. Right. When I got home that night, the uh, Maryland Paramount said, don't answer the phone, Pluto is trying to fire you. <laughs> I got up the next morning, went to Paramount, there's a board of directors, it's serious. And I walk in and Charlie said, all these years I tried to go legit, one day you had my company. <laughs> and I said, I'm not going to make an excuse. I said, you want to fire me, give me my money. I, I was fired. Charlie told Francis, and Francis said, don't let Al leave. I will have to stop the movie right now. Yep. He called me back. I went to his office. He was salivating at this time. We'll talk to the press for more time. I will kill you with my own hands. I said, calm down, Charlie. So now I'm back on the movie. My younger son was forced to leave this country because of this and lots of business. All right. I have to make arrangements to bring him back here safely. Clear of all these false charges. But I'm a superstitious man. And if some unlucky accident should befall him, if he should get shot in the head by a police officer, or if he should hang himself in his jail cell, or if he's struck by a bolt of lightning, 
And I'm going to blame some of the people in this room. It was a battle all the way through. We all, we all had a hard time. We had suffered a great deal, all of us. Francis was, all, you know, was almost fired. Now, he was almost fired, and we should explain. That Francis was shooting, the, he, he, because there was so much pre-production controversy, he never had a chance to prepare the picture as meticulously as he wanted, number one. And number two, as his later career proved, he never really prepared that well any, for, for any picture. I mean, true. To a degree, he liked confusion, to a degree. So the, 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 the picture starts, Francis is shooting, they, it's so dark, the film, the dailies were very dark. Did he explain to you that the initial dailies would be that dark? Well, to compound the felony, there was a cat at the studio, right? Right. It was not in the script. So Francis loves the cat, Marlon loves the cat, takes <laughs> the cat, those were Marlon's lap. Well, yeah. So now, the first couple of days, first of all, Gordon Willis, you know, we talked about doing it very low key, but we didn't think it would be that low key. But that aside, Marlon's petting the cat. Why does it come to me <laughs> first? And the cat's going, uh, uh. <laughs> right. Bob goes, he says, I get a call from Bob. He says, is this going to have subtitles on it? We can't know what the hell Marlon Brando said. Right. We've known each other many years, but this is the first time he ever came to me for counsel or for help. I can't remember the last time that he invited me to your house for a cup of coffee. Even though my wife is godmother to your only child. When they first saw it, they said Francis has lost. <laughs> He's out of control. We have to fire him. And they had uh, uh, Aaron McVakin was yeah, hanging there around. There was a standby person that some of the people, not you and me, wanted to substitute for Francis. So here you are. You're producing a picture which ultimately will be regarded as this iconic movie of its generation. And at this point, it's basically a shambles. It's a total mess. It's as big a mess as any movie I personally could remember, and I doubt if you ever experienced anything like that. It was a gathering of eagles. Everybody on that movie was gifted, but they all needed a hit. They all needed a hit. Yes. Francis needed a hit. Al needed a hit. Gordon, all of us. And Marlon needed most of all. Marlon was a... He had just come out of burn and what, I mean, a picture that did, died. Several of his pictures had died. Oh, Marlon worked for $100,000, yeah. you know? $100,000. $100,000. Right. And he, we had that clause in there, everyone laughed at, that he would get $100,000 for every $10 million, thinking how would it ever get to there, right? So he ended up doing okay. But the point is that it was this group of people that had coalesced at that time. And, and they really hit it out of the park. I must say, Bobby Duval, everybody. Mm -hmm. Francis was at the peak. Everyone, to a degree, came of age it's true. Uh, during, that, during that picture. And that was the amazing thing. And we should then explain in post-production, the, 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 after all of the agony of pre-production and production, you and I sit there and we see a cut that's very long. How long was the first cut that we saw? The cut was two hours and 50 minutes. Right. And the, I, the reason it was that long was that Francis was encouraged to create a long picture, right? Explain what happened, though, then. We screened the movie at, uh, on Cannon Drive. Everyone knew Bob, and we would run the movie. Bob loved it. He called up the head of the studio, Frank Blotz, in New York. I just saw it. It's great. It's two hours and 50 minutes. Frank said, I'm not putting any movie out at two hours and 50 minutes. Tell him to cut out a half hour. Nothing Bob could do. Yep. Francis went back. We did a slash black and white of the 250. He went back with Peter's in it, cut it back at 220, came back, we ran it again. Bob looked at it. He was depressed. He called your blondes up. He said, this movie is longer at 220 right. than it was at 250. And there was a slight, there was a little fight for a moment, but Bob was at him because it was so obviously. The nuance is what made the, the, the difference, the characters, why he loved them. Many of the important people in marketing and distribution said it was too talky and it would never attract a mainstream audience. So internally, the signals were negative. But, but Evans, to, to his eternal uh, credit, did preside over the restructuring of the picture to create that final, uh, and, and did an, an extraordinary job 
um, s protecting that final he cut. He did. There's no question about right. it. I mean, he, he loved the movie. He saw the movie. He believed in it. And to a great degree, he left us alone. You were a bit in shock that this picture was going to be maybe a strong movie. No question about it. Yeah. And I look back at it, and I, I look, I'm, I'm say this very unabashedly, I wouldn't have been involved in the project if it wasn't for you. You were the guy that turned me on to Francis. You know, we became, towards the end, we were adversarial for a while, then we became very good friends. The movie needed your toughness, though. That's why only you could have produced it and held it together. It needed a tough guy, and you, you succeeded in doing it. What is your personal theory as to why this picture, 40 years later, is so iconic? It baffles me a little bit. It's a brilliantly made picture, but it is a myth. It's, it is a myth today. Do you have any theories about that? I believe that there's two reasons. One is, and it was a joke for a while, but it's true. It's a family movie. Yeah. It's a family movie. It's a Greek tragedy. You know, I love the scene. He says, "Michael, I wanted more for you." When he's heartbroken, Governor Corleone, Senator, you know? I mean, shit, who doesn't understand that that has kids? I knew that Santana was gonna have to go through all this. And Fredo, oh. Fredo was, oh. And I never, I never wanted this for you. I worked my whole life. I don't apologize to take care of my family. And I refused. Be a fool. Dancing on the string held by all those big shots. I don't apologize, that's my life, but I thought that but when it was your time that that you would be the one to hold the strings. Senator Corleone. I had a screening of the Godfather in China. They didn't allow it in for five years ago. I got them to agree. I took one print with me. The Chinese sub Peter, it was played as good in China as it played in, because they have the tangs, they have the family, they have, and that's no, but number two, how often in your life can you go back and look at a movie you did and say, there's not one actor I would change. Everyone in that movie, everybody, to the smallest role. Mm -hmm was great. Yep. It became almost as close to a perfect movie as you're ever going to make. Even though, even though it's inadvertent at times, right. you were forced to make certain compromises and do certain things. But it didn't matter the totality of it. Summing up the experience, I would put it this way. Both, you and I both subscribe to the theory that a degree of conflict and tension is good in making a movie. It brings out the best in everyone. It's true. On that particular picture, too much conflict, too much tension. But bless you for making it all happen, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, bless you, Peter, because if you didn't do it, I wouldn't be sitting right here.